Hello everyone, this is Coach Carol and today we have yet another presentation in the Aussie Live 2016 series. Harry is doubling up today, this is his second in the space of two hours and today Harry's session is higher level thinking mobile activities. We do hope that you enjoy this session and that you'll interact with Harry throughout. We always love to thank our sponsors and supporters. We've got Adult Learning Australia and the Broadband for Seniors. These are our two newer sponsors this year and we're very grateful to them. Australia Series of course have been with us all along. That's our team and we now have seven in the team. Thank you to everybody. And the Learning Revolution is our partner and at the end of the session you'll see that you'll have your survey form to fill in about this session. Please take a few minutes to do that. And thank you to Steve Hargaden and to Blackboard Collaborate for the rooms we're using today. Let's see where you are in the world. In our usual way, just pick up a little smiley face or a world map and slide it over to your part of the world. Kathy has been with us for a few of our sessions today and we can see her smiling face from the east coast of the United States and Ian, an old friend, welcome back to you. I know that you're in Melbourne. North Carolina, excellent. <laughs> we are spanning quite a number of time zones today. It's always intriguing to do that. Thank you for sharing that. And of course, if anyone is on mobile device today, you'll be able to share in the text chat. So Harry Tuttle is here with us today and I'll let him introduce himself because we've heard once before a little bit about him. But Harry, tell us something else about you and what you're doing regarding mobile learning in particular and then launch into your presentation and let us know if we can ask questions. Okay, let me start with the last one, please. Anytime during the presentation, feel free to ask a question or make a comment and I'll try to react to them. Um, I have been using mobile devices for almost as long as there have been mobile devices. Um, I, as I'm going to talk during the presentation, I only use it to promote learning. We don't do other things with it. And uh, I think one of the biggest fights we've had in education is that we've called, you know, we're having students quote unquote use smartphones in the classroom. We're not. We're having them using mobile learning. And I think that's always an interesting question about that. And so I'm going to begin with an activity, if I may, that um, can you actually, uh, hopefully people have more than one device with them. And uh, if you can text two people about how can a mobile device help students learn. And I'll give you a couple minutes to do that, please. And when you finish texting two people, we could just write done in the chat bar so I know.
feel like this. I'll give Dan a few more seconds to finish his texting. I'm sort of going to start and just think you can catch up with us. I, we have so many different devices now that we can use for mobile devices, and these are only a few of them. Um, in the United States right now, the Chromebook is becoming a very popular mobile device. Um, I'd like to talk about a couple of standards. The ISTE, International Society for Talent Education, has two standards. They talk about using digital media. And environments to communicate and work collaboratively at a distance and contribute to project teams to produce original works to solve problems. And there also is another one of critical thinking, problem solving, decision making. So it's nice to think about technology in that way instead of thinking about it as the common way that quite often happens. And I want to talk about that because. What happens quite often, and I've <clears throat> been involved with technology since 1978, um, and um, during the time, one thing I've noticed is every time a new technology comes around, we always reduce it to its lowest standard, the lowest possible way. We want to use a new technology in old ways. And I think it's really important for us to think about what are the powers of technology, and in fact, how can we use that power? Because then, in fact, we're using the device for what it is. Um, and I want to give a, a quick example right now, and, and that is that can you imagine buying a Rolls Royce, a fancy, very expensive one, and using it for nothing but taking the trash to the dump? That's really what happens when, in fact, we, we have a mobile device and all we use it is, is for drill and practice. That doesn't really use the power of the technology. It, it has so much more power. I'm guessing that most of us, uh, I'd like to know whether your school is school supplied or BYOD. BYOD meaning the students bring their own devices to school. So I'll let you either put school or BYOD, please, if you would. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I am uh, I retired from public school teaching. I now teach at a community college, and my class is BYOD. Um, an interesting statistic is that even though I teach at a community school, uh, college, um, we have a lot of um, people from low-income areas, but I now have every single student in my classroom that has usually a smartphone. Okay, so it's a very interesting thing that we've reached a huge saturation of that. And we don't need to have that saturation, as I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, and this question is, if the school supplies it, do the students have access 24-7? Can they use it during school in a teacher's classroom? Are they only used on certain days? I know in some schools, they have mobile devices only when it's on Friday. I know other ones where they only use it in the teacher's classroom, but they can't take it home. So I think the question is always, how do we provide students with 24-7 access? And in my case right now, most students are seeing a smartphone as a necessity. And so it really helps us to begin thinking about um, how do we enable students to have that power. I have this slide to show you that mobile devices are all over the world, no matter where we go. Um, and um, 
what has happened is that um, one of our past presidents of the United States is actually doing an initiative to make sure that people in Africa have phones, smartphones, so that they can conduct business online. Because once they sell things, they, they can't do anything with the money. And so it's really critical for us to realize that, in fact, it is a worldwide thing. I just came back from a trip to Quito, Ecuador, and I was surprised the number of people using smartphones. It's just all over the place. And, and again, some of the images I've used have been from other presentations like this one. Um, and sometimes that's the only device they can use. So we're going to begin talking about it being a 24-7 type of learning environment. And um, the question is, if, they own, if students only use the device in school, um, do they have the same device at home? And I would argue with any school, well, my, my personal bias is any school that has a certain technology only in the classroom, that they're really depriving students of an opportunity if they don't have the same device at home. And so my focus always in class is on providing equity to students so that no matter what device they have, they can function in my classroom. And I think that's a much healthier democratic idea about technology than saying we're only going to use one technology in the classroom. Because if you go in the outside world now, you'll find out that people are, in fact, using many different technologies. And so I'm sort of going to talk about some things about vision today and using technology. And I think the biggest problem right now we have is, as I mentioned, this whole thing with drill and practice for better test scores versus project-based interdisciplinary 21st century skills. And I think we have to really know that if we do project-based interdisciplinary 21st century skills, the students are going to get better test scores because they're using it in meaningful situations. And I think it's a, a very different way of thinking about it as opposed to saying we're going to spend all our time on lower level skills. So I'd like to show you some 21st century skills and sort of show you hopefully the move that's taking place with mobile learning. We want to move from just learning facts. We know that people forget facts very quickly, but they once they understand concepts, those they remember the concepts. We want to move from lower level learning, just a little tiny factoids, to actually figuring out how to synthesize and put things together. We're moving from individual work to collaborative work, from being text-based to media-based, from one perspective to multiple perspectives. And that's becoming a very critical issue as we begin to think about a global world, is how do we really have multiple perspectives in the classroom? We want our students to move from being consumers of information to actually creating information. And the last one, work done for the teacher, work done for others outside the, the teacher, outside the classroom. And so this is, this is, the green is where we're moving to in terms of 21st learning skills. And the question is, how does our mobile devices help us to do those things? Okay, so we're going to begin sort of talking about it. And please, like I said, feel free to put any comments you want to as we're doing this. Uh, Tony, what, Tony Wagner, who's an um, educational fellow at the uh, Center for Harvard, he says that what our employers want are critical thinking. They want people to can ask the right questions. They want collaboration. They want people to be able to use their differences, their strengths, their unique strengths to come together to form something. He wants them to be risk takers. And he wants them to be performers mm -hmm. versus memorizers. Mm -hmm. And that's a very critical difference in terms of what we're actually looking for. So, in, in society. And um, recently, Google has admitted that they do not want, they're not looking for the best programmers anymore. They're looking for the programmers that can be the most creative in coming up with solutions. So it's a very different way of thinking about how we're going to move technology in that. And I think Michelangelo really summarized it for us. The greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our goals too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and achieving our mark. And when all we ask our students to do is memorize specific facts about something, we really haven't gained much at all. So 
I also want to talk about the difference between mobile device and mobile learning. Because I hear people saying, well, we're using mobile, and I'm going, so what are you doing with it? And to me, you're using mobile learning if you're collaborating, you're communicating with others. If location changes, if all you do is classroom specific, then I'm not sure it's really mobile learning. You might as well have a laptop or a desktop. And the question is, how are your students being interactive? Um, and then the bigger interdisciplinary learning goals that take place with mobile learning. Um, and I think that's really got to be some of our focuses, because otherwise, it really we, to say that we're using a mobile device is really immaterial, because we're not doing mobile learning on the device. And I want to show you this cartoon to show you um, one of the different things. I think what we should be focusing on are the tools that come natively with our smartphones, our tablets, instead of focusing on getting lots of mobile apps. I think the biggest problem we have is that I've gone to lots of sessions on using mobile learning. And they always say, well, these are the 30 apps you, use, you need for whatever. And I would disagree with them, that I think we have to say, what are the apps that we can use that have the most effectiveness in the classroom? And we know that a smartphone, a tablet, can be tons of different things. This is an example of science and the various things that a, a smartphone can be used for. Spreadsheets, word processing, movies, periodic tables, drawing animation. Notebook, assignment book, quiz, re web resources, concept mapping. Okay. So there's lots of different things that anything, any device can become. And I want to talk about apps for one second. I used to have a web page of Spanish modern language, uh, Spanish apps. And I got up to over 250, and none of them had I rated high because they were drill and practice. They didn't help the student except to memorize. They didn't teach them to use a language. And I think we have to be very careful that there's too many apps out there that don't help our students. And this, to me, is really what it should be. Every time we use a different mobile application, it should take us up a different step of learning, a higher level of learning. And so, if someone says to me they've got 10 apps, then I say, well, then you have your students reaching 10 different, 10 high levels of thinking, right? And they go, well, no. I think we've got to focus on how can we use each app to raise the student's level of thinking. And that's a very different process than trying to have as many apps as possible. One of the things that I want to comment on, and that is that I have a 90-10 rule in my classroom. And that is that 90% of the time, the students will be focusing on their learning. 10% of the time, they can focus on creating an avatar or manipulating something they have to manipulate. But that's more for the aesthetic purpose. Because as we know, students can spend all of their time creating an avatar and forget the whole purpose of the real learning. So I think we've, we've got to really say, this is going to be used for learning and focus on that. And I want to talk a little bit about a teacher's role. You know, traditionally it was the teacher who was in charge of everything in the classroom. The teacher was the center of all learning. The teacher knew everything in the classroom. They were the experts. You know, we knew had all the book knowledge. And yet now that has changed. When students have mobile devices, they can in fact access lots of particular information. I'd like to actually tell you a true story, and that was um, a teacher was lecturing about Central America and various things, and all of a sudden some boy who'd been very bored had pulled out his smart device and began looking about Central America, and he said, what about the banana wars? And the teacher said, there's no such thing, you're just making fun. And he said, no, I'm not. And he actually found out some information his teacher did not know about the topic she was talking about. So I think it's a very interesting thing that we really have to say there's lots of information out there that we can have our students use it. Our role is not to be the dispenser of information. 
Our role is to help the student, when they learn all this varied information, to put it together, to put the pieces together to see the bigger picture. And I think that's a very different concept than having them simply to drill in crafters. Along the same line, I use mobile devices because it speeds up my classroom. Um, if you notice here, my students are, have, there's a QR code, a quick response code up on the, the screen. It's part of my PowerPoint. They just stand up, they click on the QR code, and once their device says it found the link, they simply click on it and they go to it. By the way, that's quicker than they can open their textbook and find something in their textbook. Okay, it allows me to have my students go to information very quickly to interact with that information on a higher level. So I would really help you, encourage you to think about how you can make your class better. So we're now going to be going through different places. I want to talk first about motion pictures and recordings. Again, common device and everything. This picture may look like what I did during the weekend, but it really was part of a um, it's really part of a science project where students had to find different things about frequencies. And the students were required to take five pictures of different types of frequencies being produced. And then they brought them into class and talked about them. So having the students use the smartphone that they have with the camera is native to that device. The other thing is having students take two contrasting pictures, and I actually had my students do this. I can say I also teach English. And they wrote a contrast essay about the difference between a 99 cent store and Macy's, which is a department store in the United States. And again, using that power of contrast. And they, since they have pictures, they can think of a lot more things than they just put off the top of their head. Um, Marzano, a great researcher, has said that the student's ability to find similarities and differences is one of the highest things they can do in thinking process. And it raises their score the most of anything. So I'd encourage you to use a phone, their, their picture taking ability, to actually relate it to coming up with things. Okay. Um, you can use a series of pictures to tell a story. And I'd ask students to tell me, to have them show me in languages a situation that happens at home in five different pictures. And then in class we retell it in the language. But I've also heard of um, people doing this for various social studies things. So that's a great way of having your students create pictures, stories, that they can do it with. Um, students can obviously document labs that they're doing in science. They can demonstrate their use of manipulatives in a math class. And they can document it. And they can actually tell you what they're thinking as they're doing this. So it's a great way for the students to reveal their thinking and to show you that they have understood the concept along the same lines of using the tool is a big thing now are, are documentary films that are um, like a minute long and they're shot without stopping the camera at all. And so this person documented obviously a race, but I have heard of numerous teachers now telling students to document something for one minute and then bring that in and tell, discuss that. And it could be in any class they want to. Um, I've had one student, one math teacher I know, that had a student document math being used in various things. And one of the students actually did a documentary of a carpenter. And he asked the carpenter to explain how he was using math and that, and the process he went through. And it was rather revealing to students. So thinking of them having using these tools that they have with them all the time. And we know that our students want, they know how to use these tools, they use them all the time. Um, our students can create podcasts, YouTubes. In fact, our students are probably just as familiar with creating a YouTube um, as we are. And they, you, again, giving them a topic that's really worth their showing, their exploring, they're having to search for some depth about. And obviously, they can, there's voice recordings. Um, my students now don't voice record. They simply video record and don't have anything showing. They find it easier to do it that way. Does anyone have any other ideas on how they could use 
uh, pictures, movies, or just sound for higher level thinking skills. And if so, I'll give you a couple of seconds to write something down. While we're waiting, um, it's been 10 minutes since I've asked people to text. How many people have gotten answers back? If you can just indicate in the sidebar if you've gotten text backs from your people that you wrote it to. Yeah, uh, Kathy's statement about our students are not permitted to use phones in the classroom. Um, I actually one time <clears throat> had an interesting discussion with my building principal about why can he use it to conduct his business on, and our students can't use it to conduct their learning business on. I think we're really depriving students when we don't allow them the tool that the outside world is using. Uh, to me, this, it's, a, it's an issue that really prevalent. It just shows how conservative people can be and how they're not willing to accept what they use every day as a tool that is not important for students. Okay. So anybody receive any text messages back? Okay, while people are doing that, I want to make a quick comment that we're actually going to begin talking about texting now. And I want to talk about why it, yeah, that's a, a good rule, Kathy, that, you know, sometimes people just want to know. But again, I always say, you know, we're using a learning device. We're not using phones. And, and that the phones are negative. Learning devices are bad. And by the way, there's, I've never seen a, any policy book that prohibits learning devices from being used in a classroom. So I think it's just we have to be careful what we call them sometimes. I want to talk about texting, um, and that is that obviously texting can be used lots of different ways, student to teacher, uh, clarifying question. They can Twitter to Twitter, they can text to Twitter, blog, Facebook. Um, teachers can use it to text things to students, a calendar, homework, feedback, assessment. And I'd like to show you a picture of a young lady, Rin, who, while she was commuting back and forth, she texted her novel, and that novel was on the top-selling list in her country. So this has created a whole genre of writing that's done completely using a mobile device in 144 characters at a time to tell a whole novel. So it's a very interesting um, thing that that can be done when people say, well, you can't write much in 144 words. I'd like to tell you a technique that um, a social studies friend of mine uses, and that is he has his friends text. And, and you can do this, by the way, if, if you don't have a mobile device, but your, your students do have access to a learning management system that allows conversation discussion. And that is he has each of his students react to a topic, but they can only use one of these hats at a time. So if he talks about the immigration issue, for example, he'll say, okay, What's your intuitive response to it? What's your gut tell you about this topic? And they'll, they'll talk in that way, and they just say, okay, I want to know what are the negative things about immigration? And they have to think just on the negative form. And then they have to think, then the next text is, well, tell me about the positive things about immigration. And by asking students to go through each one of these different paths, they really have to think very differently about the topic. Because as we know, online discussions sometimes become mess. And this way, they're very clear, and students have to work through each of these hats. So it's a tremendous tool to be able to do that with. Um, and I would encourage anybody to have your students think using each one of these hats online about any given topic. I'm going to talk about a program, and you probably know of other ones, but Sally is a, a program where students can uh, text within a very safe environment. Um, and so. My students, for example, in Spanish have written a, a cumulative story doing it, which means you have to read the previous things and then you have to build on it to write a story. And it can work very effectively. Um, 
to have students do that. And particularly in this case, we were talking about the house and all the things that happens in a house. So you can do that. I know of a social studies teacher that at home has his students text in real time reactions to a presidential speech. And they react to classmates as the debate is going on. And he said that was one of the most powerful things that happened because they actually had to hear what someone was saying, react to it, send comments to their, their peers, and have the other peers react to them. So that's truly interactive. It means you're thinking on your feet. You're not getting something out of a book. You're using your own mind to do it. A thing that, and this particularly works better with high school kids and college kids, um, because this is actually an app called Tweet, Tweet Deck. And TweetDeck allows you to search tweets. And so what has happened is that a teacher will assign students, or students will choose a topic within the general uh, area. And then they will search, they will have the TweetDeck program search all the tweets on that topic for like two weeks. And then the students will come in and report on that. Um, I've actually had a teacher who did this. Um, about environmental issues, and different students chose different environmental factors. At the end of two weeks, they talked about it. But that means as they're reading these tweets, this is what real people are saying, the average person is saying about the topic. And so you get to see positives and differences, and you have to start to think of how does this all go together? And so it's a really higher level thinking skill, but it's a real life skill of reading something, figuring out what they have to say. So I actually had my students do this in Spanish. So it's really been very powerful um, to have that happen. Okay. Uh, I'd like to talk about surveys for a second. And an elementary friend of mine created a form using Google Forms, um, a very easy way to create a form. And he had his elementary students do the typical growing a plant and observing them. Only he had them put their information um, into the Google Form. They would pull down the little blue thing and find the team name. Uh, they type in the date, but they pull down and find their plant. They enter their information. And as soon as they did, he would show them the graph of what was happening with all the plants uh, so that they could actually talk about it and have a, an interesting discussion about why their geranium wasn't growing as well as somebody else's. Now I want to talk about not just that type of survey, but when your students do one. For example, this was one on United States politics that a social studies class developed. But the difference between that is this, that our students, usually when we would give a survey, we would have our students in the class fill out the survey, or we might ask the students to ask some people. But now, our students will generally go to Facebook or some other medium and post it. I've talked to many classrooms, and I've actually done this myself, where we can create a survey, and we can get over 600 responses. When you get 600 responses, then in fact, you've got a huge mass of data to look that you can really analyze something as opposed to having 15 people. And if you're using something like Google Forms, it does all the math for you. So you just have to analyze it. So I would encourage your students to do surveys that go out to huge numbers of people, and then they have to analyze what does, why does, what do the results mean from all this? So it's a very powerful tool. Okay, so your students can create things. I have to tell you that uh, generally I have students do the first survey among classmates so they can wrinkle out some details that don't that they haven't been aware of. But it's amazing now to have a survey go up to that. I also have to tell you quickly that um, I know of a school district where some parents, um, students got upset about something. They talked to their parents. The students designed a survey about the school, particularly parking be, be, being left off in the morning. They sent it out, and then the students went to the board. They had over 1,000 responses to their survey. Can you imagine a board reacting to 1,000 results of something? And the school made changes because that many people, they were convinced they should make changes. I want to talk about doing things more globally. And one of the great things to do is have our students look at news from, like, the BBC 
and to hear things from a different approach. And it really makes our students think very differently about what's happening. Um, what happens is that most of our classes are one-sided classrooms, and so this way it allows them to, in fact, begin seeing it from different viewpoints and to think about what that news really means. Um, I'm showing you this slide because what I quite often do is I have my students analyze sports in different countries. And a quick comment about a great way to do this is they can simply type in sports in the name of the country, and if they look on the, the, the image search, they can see lots of images of the sports in that country, and then they can begin talking about what sports are in what country and why. And lots of interesting comparisons and contrasts come out of that. I'm sure you're all familiar with um, blogs or wikis or um, all sorts of different websites that allow classes from various parts of the world to participate in. This happens to be one where every, each class led a discussion for a different week. So you can do it that way. I would encourage you to have your students interview people of another culture and to actually record that. And you can then have people talking and have each interview about a particular culture. Um, this happened to be about foods. And so this student was interviewing this person, and she was asking all these questions about what's food like in your country. And we had different students interviewing other people. So you can have your students using their mobile device the, to actually record things. Um, in the previous session, I talked a little bit about using video chat, Skype, etc., which really is such a powerful tool to having discussions about that. And when you can get someone else from another area to have a different viewpoint, then you get to see things. My students are constantly amazed when they hear people from another country talk about Celsius and, um, you know, and um, using kilograms, and we're going like, wow. So it, it, it's interesting for United States students to be exposed to people that use other things. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the sidebar. Continue otherwise. One of the things that's really intriguing is, I don't know about your students, but my students have no sense of geography. And now, whenever we come up with a, a geography item, for example, we just had a story that was based in Lima, Peru. And I had them pull up their smartphone and actually look at where Lima, Peru was and start out actually looking at it as a country. Where, where is it? What continent is it located in? Where is it located in that continent? To begin to have some feeling for that that they wouldn't necessarily do. I think one of the powerful things is for our students to, when they're learning about other countries, is to do an image search for that country. For example, these happen to be some images of Lima, Peru. And I usually ask my students to go through, find the first 20 images if they're all different, and then write down one thing they learned about the country from, or in this case, the city, from that picture. And so they end up with at least 15 to 20 different pieces of information they can learn about another country from analyzing what's in each picture. And it's a very easy tool to use and a powerful one. And I have to tell you that they will probably learn more about that country in terms of what's, what's happening in modern day than it is through presentations that we probably will have for them. Um, and again, we want to talk about how does our student learning interact? Do we have our students interacting with only our own class? Do they interact with, in my case, a college, a community, a state, other states? another country, several countries, so that we can begin to expand their viewpoints on things. Okay. I want to talk about QR codes. Um, I'm sure you all know about quick response codes. This actually was a Russian pavilion, and every one of those squares either has a video, a story. Um, each one is, is a, a whole different thing, so you can stand in the whole thing and click on each one and find out different information about what's going on. So the power of QR codes is that um, it can link to audio, video, picture, text, word processing information, websites, forms, quizzes. And all the students have to do is if, if they have a QR code reader, they simply click on the image and plus, they're there. 
And I want to show you what I think is a magnificent example of this. And in this school, students drew something, then they talked about their painting, and it was recorded and made into a QR code. So you now can look at the student's art, take your smartphone or mobile device, click on the QR code, and hear the story, the student telling about the picture, telling about what's happening. And that makes it truly interactive. And Students really do a lot more in-depth thinking as they go to explain their painting and what's going on. Some schools have gone to having their students do um, QR code tours of their city or museums or things. And in this particular case, they have QR codes of the famous buildings and each, and each one tells about the famous building, what's there, why it's there. And so someone can actually explore the city or town doing that. Um, I've actually heard of more and more places that are allowing students to create QR codes for museums, um, science museums, even art museums, um, his local history, and so that it becomes accessible to everybody. Um, the, another example here is that in this case, in a zoo, a zoo allowed people to create QR codes that would tell more about what was, they were watching. So, a teacher could simply, or anybody could click on the QR code and they can learn about the tortoises that were there and lots more information. You don't have to read it, you can hear it being spoken to you. Okay, or you can see pictures of other tortoises. So, it, QR codes allow us to expand the world of learning. Okay, um, and I want to talk quickly about how to do this because. Um, all you really need to do is have a QR code program, and there's lots of them. This is one I particularly like. Um, and all you do is you take the URL from whatever web page you want, you put it into that program, you decide on the size you want of your QR code, a small one or a big one, and you, you click, you, it's an image then. So you can put your image in your PowerPoint, you can put it on a handout, you can put on anything you want so that students are able to use that and access that information. So it's a great thing to be able to have students expand and do that. Um, I actually have used QR codes after test, and I give students three different ways of learning about relearning the information if they didn't learn it the way I taught it. And so they can go to those different websites, and one will focus on auditory, one will focus much more on visual, one will do something much more with actions or some other way of or concept method, excuse me, something else that helps them. So it's a great way to use QR codes as an assessment. I want to talk about the power of QR codes. Um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, PDFs. You can PDF anything, put it up on a website, and students can access it. Um, my students would not normally. Is there a way to? Um, you can link a QR code to any web address. And you have to make sure it's on its own page for each QR thing. Okay, so what I've done here is my students, we were reading Don Quixote um, in my English class. And so I put it on, P on a PDF, I found a, a way that it was online and I could PDF it so my students could read it. And the important thing is, that they can then search for different information and find information in the story rather quickly. And I want to give you an example of that. Here's a story we do of Garcia Lorca's blood wedding. And I will have my students when a topic in, you know, as we're reading through and they say, well, what's this with a knife? And I'll say, okay, your group is responsible for finding how many times the knife appears in this play, who has the knife, when do they have it, for what purpose do they have it? And they can actually search through the whole document, the whole play, very quickly to find every reference to knife. And they can begin to understand how the author has tended to use that. By the way, I've done this with um, ninth graders. This activity, about 20 years ago, would have been a doctoral dissertation, being able to find all the references to something in a play, or in Shakespeare, for example. Our students can now search any document for a concept. How often is freedom, the word freedom, actually mentioned in this document? And they can begin to really do some great thinking about that. Okay. So it, it's really a powerful tool for having students analyze things they might not have 
I want to talk about assessment for a second, because it's a big word. Um, I basically, there's lots of different ways of who's going to assess what. We can have an app assess them, a different app. We can have, you know, paper and pencil test, online evaluation. We can assess them online. Someone from the school, someone in the class school or another school can assess it. Someone outside the school can. If the students can do a digital format, it can be sent to anybody outside. And I know in many, there are many um, school alternative schools now that in fact are pushing for evaluation of student work from people done outside of the school. And when the students do their portfolio review, they have to have an outsider to do that. I also want to show you that as a teacher, I use my mobile device to keep track of student information. If students are doing things in the class, I actually record the information. I walk around, listen to students, and put a number in my thing, in the spreadsheet, for example. And I can quickly analyze if the student's improving in his or her ability. So that's a really great uh, thing to do. We all, are, I'm sure, are familiar with instant um, audience feedback things like poll everywhere where we can get some information. And my only concern about, and, you know, and here's one in Spanish, for example, using Google Forms. The students, I, I have a QR code to it. The students take it. And as soon as they take it, I instantly throw the graph up on the screen. And then I, so I know how many have got it correct, how many missed it. But more importantly is I then give feedback as to how to get the correct answer. They need to have a new strategy. Um, I also monitor my class sometimes by just having a checklist. And this is on my mobile device, so I can actually click on it and find out how they're progressing through things and who needs more my attention more in class. Okay. And I want to make a quick comment that a poll or a survey is not formative unless we give students a new strategy. It's not enough to know if there's a problem. We have to be able to tell the student a new way of thinking that they can therefore learn the information and process it better. So that's critical to me. I want to talk about some references. We now know that because they have the internet, they have access to almost all the knowledge that there is, uh, all the factual knowledge is on the internet, basically. And so uh, here's an example of something that my students do. They read a poem. Um, this is by Gabrielle Nee Stiles, Tiny Feet. Children's tiny feet to suck in little gems. How can the people pass on seeing? And I ask them to then go on the internet using an image search and find out which image best represents the meaning of the stanza. And for example, they might have these possible pictures. And the question is, which of those pictures best represents the, the thing for the whole stanza? not just an individual line. And it takes a lot of higher level thinking to be able to come up with that. So it's really important for us to put students in situations where they are going to be asked to think. Okay. And so basically at the end of my presentation, if you have questions or comments, please enter them. Thank you, Harry. Wow. There was so much to think about. I wanted you to... Um, slow down a little bit because I was trying to do too many things, of course. <laughs> so I'm just going to go back to, uh, oh, you don't have titles on your slides. So I'm just going to see if I can find the one I want. Bear with me as I stretch through them. No, I can't find the one I want. Um, no. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's so many ideas uh, that are coming out of this. I think what's happening for me is happening to people in the audience too, is that you are inspiring that kind of thinking about um, collaboration and the way in which we can do it at a higher level. And the imagery that you've used in the slides helps us to spark another idea. So I want to thank you for that. Let's see if um, Kathy or Megan would like to come to the microphone. We haven't heard from you before, and uh, Kathy will be presenting later on. You might want to practice your audio. So if you want to do that, just um, I've given you microphones. Just click on the talk button and say what you're thinking about. And Megan is on a mobile device, so she's really testing out 
everything we're doing today about mobile devices. <laughs> Hi, um, I've just been thinking about um, just really how to approach the school and then how to get these ideas um, implemented into my classroom. I think I have some interesting um, topics that I need to cover with students so it's really got me thinking outside the square on how to cover some of the drier aspects of these topics. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, absolutely, Megan. Uh, it is a challenge though, isn't it? Because not everyone is going to have the same thought processes because unfortunately they haven't shared in these sessions. So one good thing you might like to do is to share the recording link with your colleagues and get them to talk about what they view after the event. Kathy, would you like to make any comment? Do you want to try your microphone by clicking the talk button? Not sure if you are with us in the room or getting ready for your... Ah, there you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> there you go. See, even more technology is happening at Kathy's household. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that funny? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm here. Um, I wanted to thank Harry. He, I work with mostly with teachers, and you have given me such a twist on my perspective, as well as a lot of great ideas, practical ideas that I can share with teachers who are resistant sometimes to these collaborative tools. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Harry. Yeah, to me, if we can't be practical during the presentation, then you know, <laughs> I think that's what it's all about, is sharing very precise things so that people can get inspired. And by the way, I, I really want to tell you that many of these ideas really are because people shared them with me as I was a director of technology, or since then, since I'm in you know, contact with a lot of people, and they share ideas. And I think it's how we all get better is by sharing our ideas with each other. I agree. So thank you. Well, I was just getting through to the, the final slide that Harry was sharing with us. And once again, Harry, if you wanted to put in your Gmail account into the text chat for our audience, not only in the room today, but those who are going to be viewing later, they could certainly benefit and get in touch with you. Yep, I'm happy to. And just the only thing I ask is that people identify what it is there. Uh, sometimes, as you all know, sometimes you get emails from people and you go, what are you really talking about? Uh, so mm -hmm. it helps that people identify that it was from this conference that they, I can't finish my email address on that for some reason. Um, so I'm gonna Having trouble? Email. Yeah, so it, it won't put the rest of them. I'm going to give another email. There we okay. go. Oh, you have two different ones. Okay. Okay, either one works. Either one works. Good. Yeah. All right. And yes, if you are emailing Harry, just uh, identify what in particular you would like further information about. And certainly, uh, we'd be keen to have a look at the ebook. Uh, it's a very reasonable price. It, where is that available from, Harry? Um, it's. Oh, doesn't. Oh, oh gosh, it's not a click on there. Um, if you search for 90 mobile activities for modern language, it'll pop up. Yep. It's, not, it's on uh, Smashwords. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Megan, I understand that little problem that you're having there with uh, spelling from an iPad, <laughs> even from mobile phones. The predictive texts and uh, strange keyboards, <laughs> a different touch, it really makes all the difference. So we need to have different skills on different devices. All right. Thank you, Harry, for a wonderful session once again. And thank you so much for coming back again this year to present for us in Aussie Live 2016. It's a pleasure.
And just a reminder to everyone that we do have another session happening as we speak. And if you would like to join us in that one, uh, let me just put the link back in place again. I had put it further up, so I'll just copy and paste. That's part 20, it's called. And we will be listening to our keynote for today, who is Deanne Houston. And she's going to be talking about virtual drama. A really exciting presentation from Deanne. Very different. And I advise you to come along if you can. If not, of course, go to the recording later. At the end of the session, you'll be invited to do a little survey feedback on Harry's session. Just take a moment or two to do that. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I. Thanks, Harry. You're welcome. Goodbye.